Well, I would love to be with you there in person. I'm recording this on the East Coast. But the good news is that whatever my presentation might lack in insight, wisdom, content, it makes up for in having a very low carbon footprint. So before I get started and talking about the substance of my talk, which is called, and therefore, about the relationship between environmental chemistry and green chemistry, I really want to say that being part of this symposium is like speaking amongst giants who I have looked up to throughout my career, including our prize winner today for the 2020, 2021 Dreyfus Prize. Congratulations. So the reason that I'm so excited about being with all of these other speakers is because of my deep respect for the field of environmental chemistry. Because as we know, environmental chemistry and chemistry in general has always had two aspects to it, the so-called Janus face. You know, with environmental chemistry, we know that environmental chemistry allows us to understand the world as it is. And if all it did was allow us to understand the way that not our materials interact and transform and behave in the natural environment, that would be spectacular. But of course, environmental chemistry has always been about also giving us information on human environment impacts and uh, things about uh, pollutants and contaminants and how the people of society are changing the environment. It also helps us inform ways of dealing with it, mitigation strategies and remediation strategies. When we start thinking about the work that that people in this symposium have have pioneered and, and led, whether it's in water chemistry, whether it's in atmospheric chemistry, whether it's in uh, climate, climate change insights, our water cycle, our, our nitrogen cycle, our carbon cycle, these types of leaders in the science of environmental chemistry are ones that we all owe a great debt of gratitude to because it's this precise monitoring that is playing such a crucial role in understanding the intersection of the, the anthropogenic and the natural uh, phenomena that we're all witnessing and how we have monitoring that's ongoing over time so that we can identify environmentally important compounds or contaminants and pollutants and what the implications of those are. Being able to characterize these phenomena as whether or not they're um, a, a, a risk or a threat or how fast things are changing is crucial to environmental chemistry. And this precise analysis allows us to understand the magnitude of those impacts so that we can try to manage those environmental changes and impacts that are going to be so critical to the future. I really want to emphasize how essential I believe environmental chemistry is and how important the work has been over the decades at helping us understand our world. Just one illustration is this chart that shows over the decades that while the economy was growing, travel was increasing, population was increasing, at the same time, because of the work of environmental chemistry and the information and data and knowledge that it provided, we as a society, as a world, were able to reduce these pollutants dramatically. So it's absolutely essential. I could, I could produce things on water pollution, on all kinds of different effects. Environmental chemistry is absolutely essential. But a big part of what I want to chat with you about today is, is it sufficient? So the knowledge, is the data, is the analysis that we have from 
traditional environmental chemistry sufficient? And I, I think all of us in this room would recognize that the, the sustainability challenges that we're looking at, the climate challenges that we're facing, the, the resource depletion issues that we're facing, the biodiversity issues that we're confronting, are all requiring action that, that builds on the information of environmental chemistry. So we come back to the Janus faces of chemistry. We always want to recognize the understanding of how materials flow in the environment and the transformations that are there. But of course, the second phase is the side that creates new molecules, new materials, and new transformations. Those two halves of chemistry are also the two halves of environmental chemistry. The understanding, the insight, the data, the knowledge, the information, and the creation, the invention, the innovation. So the question becomes, how do we use the understanding that environmental chemistry gives us about the material flows and transformations and use it to ensure that the new molecules, the new materials, and the new transformations are going to be conducive to life now and into the future. So that's the big and therefore. With all of the knowledge provided to us over the many years by environmental chemistry and today, the and therefore is we must do things differently. We must change the way that we do things because the only reason to really deeply understand a problem is to inform and empower its solutions. So that's why I'd like to talk to you about green chemistry because green chemistry stands on the shoulders of environmental chemistry giants. Green chemistry, as most of you know, is all about designing new chemicals and new products and manufacturing processes so that they are not hazardous. They don't use or generate hazardous substances. Hazardous to the planet, hazardous to people. And it's, it's held up by 12 pillars, the 12 principles of, of green chemistry. Now, green chemistry is something that is over the past 25 years, grown uh, from a nascent idea into something that's all over the world. That there's um, every major university has, has research, perhaps a research center, courses on green chemistry. There's the Green Chemistry and Commerce Council that has 200 to 300 global corporations. There's a Green Chemistry Pharmaceutical Roundtable and on and on. There's probably eight or ten scientific journals devoted to green chemistry. So this is an expanding field. And I want to talk just a little bit about the Center for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering at Yale. Um, just to provide you a few examples of the basic research and how we hope that that basic research is making an impact. The, the center cuts across the School of Environment, uh, the Chemistry Department, Chemical and Environmental Engineering, as well as Public Health. And its mission is, yes, to do fundamental basic research without question. And it's on, it's on synthesis, it's on materials, it's developing new research platforms and tools such as computational approaches. But it doesn't stop there. It's also about how we train the next generation of chemists and engineers around these concepts, these principles. But catalyzing implementation is why the center works with just about every industry sector in taking the, this basic research into practical application at scale. And a big part of our challenge is raising awareness because we know that there's still a lot of people that do not yet know what green chemistry is all about. So 
One of the things environmental chemistry has made abundantly clear that in a sustainable world, we're going to have to move away from a petroleum-based economy into a bio-based economy. Well, one of the things that is going on at the, at the center is the development of approaches that make sure that any bio-based economy is not going to compete with food, feed, or land use options, that it's going to not be chemically intensive, not uh, uh, affect uh, sustainable water provisions and has energy and material inputs that make sense. And the integrated biorefinery efforts at the center is saying we need to learn the lessons from the petroleum refinery. Petroleum refineries are an absolute technological miracle. The amount of efficiency, material and energy efficiency, that comes out of a petroleum refinery is to be marveled. But yet, with bio-based products, and especially biofuels, that same kind of approach has not been completely adopted. And so we're looking at how you get value from every distillation fraction of the of the inputs, just like petroleum does. Now, one small example that I just want to um, share is work done a number of years ago by a graduate student named Patrick Foley in my group. Uh, and it was about taking on the challenge of making bio-based surfactants. Everybody knew that O-glycosides, a sugar and a fat connected through an oxygen, were easy to make, but they weren't very durable. And so they didn't have as broad of applicability in the, in the range of formulations that they could because surfactants are used in just about every formulated product. Making it a C-glycoside, where you connect the fat and the sugar through the carbon, was a synthetic challenge. That Patrick was able to, uh, uh, to solve. We were able to make both linear and cyclic um, uh, types of molecules. And, and get patents. And the point that I want to make is, is yes, that the fundamental science was very good, new synthetic methodologies to a useful chemical class. But what was perhaps at least as important is that this became the basis of P2 science. A chemical manufacturing company today that makes specialty chemicals, you know, all based on the, the forest and the field and Patrick Foley is the co-founder um, with me of this company. And this company now has a wide range of specialty chemicals, showing that by even getting value from small volume, high value uh, ingredients, you can make the economics of uh, a bio-based economy work uh, that complements the large volumes small value applications like fuel. So that's what that was really all about. All right, environmental chemistry tells us that we want to and must address water contamination. And perhaps we want to do it with degradable bio-based waste products. So the approach that's being used in the, in, in the center is being led by Professor Julie Zimmerman. Uh, so... This is taking a bio-based waste, chitosan, to develop ways of removing things like arsenic out of our waterways, our rivers, our streams. Um, and by doing particular types of cross-linking, you can use that chitosan so that it selectively removes things like arsenic preferentially over phosphate, which is, of course, ubiquitous. So these approaches are so dirt cheap they can be used in emerging economies with locally available materials. So this is yet another approach to that uh, way of using biomaterials that we're um, doing at the center. Of course, environmental chemistry, and especially those focused on climate change, are telling us we might need to move to some different approaches for our, for our energy. And green hydrogen is a, certainly a big topic. We, 
we know that whether it's solar, when the sun's not shining, or wind, when the wind's not blowing, we need to store that energy. And so storing it as uh, hydrogen is going to be um, certainly crucial. Getting that hydrogen from water to make green hydrogen can be done, but we want to do it with earth-abundant catalysis. Um, these ca catalysts, we know that we can split water with things like uh, iridium, but uh, uh, a few years back, uh, one of the nicest people I know and a brilliant scientist, uh, Bob Crabtree and I collaborated um, to develop a new cobalt-based catalyst, which is 10,000 times more abundant than, than iridium um, and 10,000 times less expensive. Now, we all want to recognize that a lot of cobalt is coming from a conflict region in uh in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But with those uh, circumstances in mind, using um, cobalt as the catalyst for water splitting, uh, whether it be photolytic or electrolytic, uh, to carry out both freshwater splitting as well as seawater splitting that performs well over time is a tremendously important advance. And, Yes, we were able to publish those papers and get those patents. But what's more important, once again, is that this has gone to scale um, in certain ways with catalytic innovations. A company that is commercializing this technology and selling or licensing or uh, applying this technology to a wide range of other companies and corporations. So we have this, this hydrogen. I should mention that we also want to store this hydrogen safely, right? And so my collaborator, Robert Tuba, over in Budapest, um, and I developed this ammonia borane system uh, that allows not only to store the hydrogen, but also have it release. So very high energy or storage density, I should say, hydrogen density, and allow it to be released quite effectively um, in non-hydrolytic conditions. So we want to be able to generate that green hydrogen. We want to be able to store that hydrogen safely because we know of all the safety concerns. But we also want to do certain things with that hydrogen. So, what is it that we want to do with that hydrogen? Maybe we want to use it to convert one of our biggest, most critical, most urgent waste problems into a solution. So, how do you turn your carbon dioxide into value-added products? I want to mention the air company. The graduate student who is working on that cobalt catalyst, one of those graduate students was Stafford Sheehan on the right. Greg Constantine is on the left, who's the CEO of Air Company. And their business is all about how do you convert, yeah, the elements of the air, um, water, CO2, sunlight, into valuable products. And their first product out of the Air Company that I'm happy to be a part of and be a science advisor to is a luxury vodka. Yes, a luxury vodka that's winning taste tests around the world. But it is the first carbon negative spirit. And you would be well justified in asking, well, why? Why would you think that uh, carbon negative vodka is going to do anything for climate change? That's not the point. The point is to capture people's imaginations. Capturing people's imaginations that if you can make a luxury vodka out of CO2, then it's easy for people to imagine that you can make much larger scale things like, uh, you know, concrete, building materials, um, recarbonation of soils, polymers, plastics, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes, product one was vodka, but the future is around things like rocket fuel. So, Air Company recently won a competition from NASA for uh, converting CO2 into rocket fuel and other molecules. 
and this is what the future looks like. And if you look at uh, what the air company is projecting that if everyone did convert to air company technology and what that means for ethanol, methanol, and kerosene, you can see the type of real, genuine impacts that this kind of technology could bring about. Okay, so some of you might remember the petroleum tree. Remember it was about where, where petroleum goes and how it cascades throughout the economy. And then there was the chlorine tree about how chlorine uh, cascades throughout the economy to make all kinds of products. Well, um, a little bit ago, we took that tree metaphor and applied it to green chemistry. Because as much as I'd love to talk more about the, uh, the work coming out of my group in the center at Yale, the truth of the matter is these innovations, these inventions, these new technology platforms are taking place all over the world. So we did this meta review, um, included um, many hundreds of reviews representing thousands of researchers around the world. And the whole point was to show that green chemistry has never been about what you need to uh, stop doing, what you need to review, uh, reduce, what you need to um, ban. It's always been about what you can do, what you can invent, what you can innovate. Um, and each branch was one of the principles of green chemistry. Each leaf was a new technology platform that has either been invented or developed significantly in the 25 years since the 12 principles of green chemistry. So I encourage you, if you're interested in all of the, the developments, that uh, this might be a review that you may be interested in, uh, in reading, uh, because it does take a look at those inventions and innovations. I want to um, mention a particular uh, paper that science invited us to do, I guess it was last year. It was designing for a green chemistry future. And it was looking at how do we do things differently from today? And what would a green chemistry future look like? And we went through a framework where, yes, you want to absolutely make sure that the products that you produce are highly functional and have high performance. But you also want to make sure that they're made from renewable feedstocks and that they're not going to be toxic. And that if they're distributed in the environment, dispersed in the environment, that they degrade. And if they're able to be used in a, in a captive way, that they're built back into the circular economy, the so-called circular economy. So this all is really building out of the 12 principles of green chemistry and quite frankly, feels quite obvious. But yet, when we compare the way that we have historically done things and sadly how so many companies and sectors still do things. It is not yet the, the rule, but rather the exception. So uh, this science paper with the reference right here outlines that transformation of how we do things now into how green chemistry would do them in the future. Uh, so I'd recommend that to you. But here's the big in there for, why do we do it? Why do we, why do we choose to do these things uh, in chemistry? Why do we choose to do our chemistry differently? It's because when we learn the lessons of environmental chemistry, when we have the challenges made so clear to us by the science of environmental chemistry that has been talked about in this symposium and has been building over the decades, we recognize that the world needs to know about green chemistry, needs to, to be capable of doing green chemistry in order to get some of these sustainable solutions. There's something called the United Nations uh, Yale Green Chemistry Initiative, Global Green Chemistry Initiative, where we are spreading that word globally. And uh, that will be building and, uh, and launching a major new phase uh, this summer. Because at the end of the day, 
it's really all about how we're going to achieve the 17 sustainable development goals. And I, for one, believe that chemistry is at the heart of the solutions. Some people say, oh, it might solve one or two. I actually think that if we really uh, consider these deeply, that chemistry is a thread throughout the vast majority, if not all of them. And I guess on the anniversary of the periodic table of the elements, we, we use the metaphor of the periodic table to show the aspects or, yes, the elements of green and sustainable chemistry. We're at the heart of the periodic table where the transition metals usually lie are the, uh, the scientific and technological approaches of green chemistry and green engineering. But there's also, to the left, are the elements of the humanitarian goals. To the right are the conceptual frameworks, the regulatory frameworks, the economic frameworks, and all the way to the right are our noble goals. Those, those visions of a sustainable future that may be over the horizon, but it's what we keep on striving for. And this um, was turned into a book that was re released fairly recently. Um, called The Periodic Table of the Elements of, of Green and Sustainable Chemistry um, by myself and my co-author, uh, Julie Zimmerman from Yale. And I do want to say that, well, if somebody wanted to get a hard copy of this book, you can get it on Amazon. I wanted to give a gift to everybody uh, in attendance of this symposium, and that website will allow you to download the ebook freely. Have it freely distribute it freely if you if you like it tries to give some perspective on uh, on these on these uh, challenges that we face and the approaches of green chemistry and green engineering it was truly an honor to be part of this symposium and I want to sincerely thank the organizers for the invitation